um, come up here to talk to you guys. Um, as, a, as an owner of a lot of organic livestock, um, we're always looking for um, extra grazing for some of our cattle. So if there's, you know, we're here to talk about if there's some grain farmers that want to integrate cattle into their system, um, a few things how, uh, just give some tips on how that could work. So just a little bit, that's a picture of me and my wife and my son. And I farm uh, alongside with my parents, Danny and Robin Lebro. Um, just, we're a family ran business. Uh, we're located at Pipestone, just about an hour southwest of here. Um, we transitioned to organic in 2009 and uh, it's been the best move I ever did. Uh, and haven't looked back since. So just to get into a little bit of, uh, I'm not gonna spend much time, just gonna go over a few things that if someone is interested in, uh, in uh, looking at getting some cattle on the land, some of the things you need to do, um, if we were to send cattle, what you would need to have set up, custom grazing, cover crops, or green manure. Um, one of the things when you're planning something, you need to have staggered seeding dates, and, a, a, and Ben mentioned a lot of this stuff already. Um, and having a mix of fall seeded crops and uh, spring seeded because the cattle have to move through that and stay ahead of it. And you've got to have a long period of grazing to, to make it, uh, to get the full benefit because cattle have an adjustment period to get onto these things too. So you can't just have 500 acres seeded at the same time and expect the cattle to get through. Fencing, this is something that would have to be um, an investment. It doesn't have to be that expensive. Like as Ben said, electric fencing is fairly reasonable and uh, it can be set up temporary too. Um, it's easily put up and easily taken down. Um, we, we do, we're starting to do more and more of this on our farm too. Um, one of the things we're using is there, there's the, we use a lot of that uh, aircraft cable now too. Um, it works really well for portable fencing and it's really tough in the winter time. Water supply, Ben talked on this too. That's crucial, which I know a lot of in grain farmer situations um, where there's not a lot of cattle, water is probably one of the biggest, one of the biggest issues of getting cattle on the land. You need a good water supply. And that's, uh, it's critical to have good water. You can't, you can't just have a muddy dugout. You need fresh water or at least a good dugout for them to go into. Um, and one thing too that you gotta remember is that cattle are, you gotta have somewhere to gather them up and to unload and to reload cattle because uh, when we're moving cattle around, they, uh, they need a spot to rest when they get off the truck and, and uh, need a truck access at all times, no matter what the weather is. Um, it, uh, it's very important to have solid fencing, especially on younger cattle. Um, so you need to be solid fencing like steel, portable steel or, uh, or permanent, whatever. Um, and cattle also, you need to think of extreme weather conditions. Um, if there's extreme rainfall, which we all know we get a lot of in Manitoba lately, um, if you, you can't have those cattle on, a, on, a, on an annual cover crop because they'll just wreck your field, right? So you need, in, in case you have to have somewhat of a plan to have some order that goes in case of extreme weather event like that. Um, things to remember too, like the talking about uh, the results of grazing these cattle are they reflect on your management. Like if you're not going to put the, you can't just put the cattle out on a fence, put one strand around a quarter section, put the cattle out there, and expect them to do amazing things. It takes a lot of management, and uh, whatever you put into it is what you get out of it. Um, but if you do it, if it's done properly, it can be very rewarding financially. Um, and that's not even counting, you know, soil benefits also. Uh, cattle owners <clears throat> carry the risk on the cattle and the cost of moving the cattle. So you got to remember that when you're doing that, that, uh, you know, that goes back to the cost of what you're going to get per pound of gain. Everyone thinks they should get all the, all the, when you're grazing, some, some people think they should get all the benefit of the gains. Well, that's, but there's no risk to the guy gracing the cattle because um, the guy owning the cattle has all the risk. Um, and great management makes great beef. Um, 
But yeah, that's about it for now, and uh, I'll let Cody talk about what he's got going on. All right, well, while we're loading, I'll uh, start into my presentation. Uh, my name is Cody Straza. My wife, Allison, and I, we farm at uh, Wood Mountain, Saskatchewan, which is very south central in the province. Uh, we have uh, three little boys that uh, farm with us, and well, they will be farming with us. And I just got to say, after listening to these two guys and the, the advice they've given, I wish I'd have heard this a couple years ago because we've made all those mistakes, learned from them, and here I'm, to sh I'm here to share some of those mistakes. Okay, so there's us, there's where we are. Um, we're fairly high and dry. We're uh, approximately 3,000 feet elevation. We're average rainfall 12 to 14 inches, which like was uh, explained earlier, averages, you never have an average, it's either way above or way below. And uh, for the last number of years, we've been using the, the soil health principles. I'm going to talk mostly about that last one, the livestock integration, but during the q and I'd love to talk about how that really can benefit the other four really nicely. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Neil. Uh, Neil works with us on the farm, uh, but to be honest, he's a rancher at heart. Uh, we've been organic grains since 2010, and uh, that's when Alice and I moved back to the farm. We bought our farm at that time, and uh, we decided we're going to get this grain thing figured out, then we'll get into livestock. Well, in 2017, we had a real dry year, and I had Neil on a roller crimper putting down this, this beautiful yellow clover crop in the middle of a drought, haze in a shortage, and he's scratching for feed saying, you know, we really need to be putting this through a cow. Yeah, okay, and I said, well, let's come up with a plan and, and let's get to it next year. So over the winter, we developed a plan and at Upland Organics, we seeded our cover crops as normal. We did all of this, we sourced the seed and we did the seeding. And Neil and his, his ranch, Heartland Ranch, um, they provided the cattle, managed all the moves, did the fencing, the water, and the, the, he was responsible for all the herd health and the loss. So, and he was bringing in customer cattle. He was custom grazing somebody else's cattle on our land. And we didn't really know where this was going. We didn't really have a template to follow and who's going to make out better and where, which way money should be flowing. So for the first year, we just decided that, okay, we're going to try this out and no money's going to change hands. We're going to get our cover crops terminated for free, which we would normally be running a disc or the, the, the roller crimper, paying wages, burning fuel, depreciating iron. But now we don't have any of those expenses. He's coming in and he's doing a lot of work. He's going to be doing the fencing. He's going to be hauling water every day because we don't have a water infrastructure in all of our fields. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so these are some of the, the crops that we seeded. Uh, not all together. We uh, seeded different combinations of these. But the important thing is to see is that we had warm season, cool season, grasses, broad leaves. We had tall crops, short creeping crops, tap roots, creeping roots. We tried to get as much diversity as we could into our cover crops. And we had a plan. Wow, did we have a plan. Uh, cows are going to arrive this day, move on that day, and it was just going to flow like clockwork. Um, yeah, this, this schedule is out the window before the cows arrived. Uh, we ended up, uh, we were grazing. Oh, and one, one of the big problems with this is we approached this like a bunch of grain farmers. Just like Bryce was saying, you have to stagger your seeding dates. We had 450 acres to graze, ready to go today. We had 100 pairs, 100 cow-calf pairs to do it. We didn't have nearly the animals. We didn't have the, the maturity staggered. It, uh, yeah, uh, we, we learned a lot that first year. That was uh, 2018. Uh, we ended up uh, grazing about three to five acres per day. We moved them every day. We had perimeter fence on some of the fields. Other, we had to make a, a perimeter. Typically, on the perimeter, we ran one uh, high tensile wire, and then inside, we ran just a, a single poly wire. Uh, we also moved water every day. Our first year, we were hauling uh, probably two trips a day with the old three-ton. The next year, we upgraded to um, two tanks on a tandem truck. Uh, to back up a little bit, after our first year, we kind of did an evaluation how th everything went with Neil and with, with us. And, uh, he said for, for him, and it, it was an after work thing because it was on his own time. He said that was quite a bit of work for one person. 
So he suggested that we take on the custom grazing contract on the farm, and then he, that's part of his job on the farm is to manage the cattle. And in 2019, that, that did work out fairly well. Uh, some of the results in 2018, it, it, we were really dry. And where we had a good crop, we were able to get a good ground cover. Where nothing grew, there was not a whole lot left for the cows to leave. So did, it, did we see a real benefit there? No, but would we have seen much better plowing in a, a green manure crop? I, I doubt it. Uh, 2019, later in the year, was a lot better. We had, uh, well, this was a pea and oat crop that we were in, and um, it, when we get rain, we can do some really neat things. When we don't get rain, it's, it's kind of a sad state. Um, and I've, yeah, I, I've never played in cow pies so much in my life. It was really neat to see the dung beetles move in. And on land that, in my lifetime, has never seen cattle, there were dung beetles there right with the cows. Um, and they were, well, and I'm sure Gary Richards is going to talk about more about this tomorrow in his talk, but they were carrying that manure down into the land. They were just aerating the land, doing some really great stuff. So some of the lessons we learned from that, um, that cover crops can be, a, the just annual cover crops can be a great source of grazing, stack of the crop maturity, uh, need for uh, great partners, um, have somebody that understands your uh, priorities, but also take time to understand their priorities. And uh, have an agreement, have something written, and put a term on it that we're going to do this for a year. We're, each of us agree we're going to stick it out. We're going to stick to our side of the agreement for one year, and then we'll reevaluate. And you have to be adaptable. When uh, uh, we got into that situation where we had all that uh, cover crop ready to go right now, well, we had to get a little creative. We did some swath grazing. We grazed some that was a little over mature. Um, and then we ran out of feed. We had to get them into some uh, um, uh, kind of wasteland areas until we get them onto stubble grazing. So it uh, took a little bit of creativity, but uh, we made it through. And uh, it was lessons learned that we can apply to, to next time. So where do we go from here? Um, Neil's done a pretty good job of easing us into this cattle idea. And this past fall, we ended up buying our own herd. So now we have more flexibility. We can get the cows on and off the land when we want. And we've got a few more numbers to be able to play with as well. And we, the cows arrived last October. We're already using them to benefit the grain land. That this is uh, some, some grain land that is at a little uh, eroded knoll where the cows are. And you can see on the left-hand side, it's just kind of a, a gray dust. There's no organic mat uh, matter there. There's no soil structure. But we s spent, I think, about two weeks feeding the cows on that knoll. And they're creating a, a really nice manure pack. Um, and I'm really looking forward to next year, uh, seeding right through that. And uh, hopefully, we're kickstarting that biology to get something green and growing, getting a living root back in the soil, and rebuilding that soil. So thank you for your time, and look forward to your questions. Thanks, Cody, Bryce. Um, are there any burning questions from the audience at the moment? Um, if not, maybe I can kick things off here a bit. Um, Cody, I'm curious about uh, some of the thinking behind why you opted to get livestock onto your farm as opposed to just, uh, you know, uh, just using your, your covers as green manures, uh, like, and, and whatever, basically swathing them down or crimping them down. What, what kind of benefits have you seen in bringing livestock onto your farm as opposed to just working the covers into the soil? Uh, that was quite a process that, oh, quite a few years ago, when we were evaluating our whole cover crop green manure plow down program, we saw some research that uh, I believe Martin Enns did at the U of M. And the most effective nitrogen capture is to use a tandem disc to put your cover crop into the soil. But when we got into more of the soil health principles and realizing that nitrogen capture isn't the only aspect to be looking at, um, that's when we started using things like the roller crimper. And we were challenged by a researcher at uh, the Swift Current Research Development Center that a lot of that nitrogen is going to volatilize off to the atmosphere. You're not going to be getting that, that nutrient cycle that, that we're looking for. 
So that's when we well, did a little quick figuring and we're cycling the nutrients now through the cattle, through the manure and the urine and hopefully we're finding a, a happy medium in between that we're still keeping the soil covered. Um, we're not breaking up the aggregates, we're not breaking up the root channels for the infiltration, but we are hopefully cycling that back into the soil in a, a relatively quick manner, an effective manner. Makes sense. Um, Bryce, I know you have, uh, I don't know if you, have you sent any of your cattle out to other farms to, to do some grazing or what, what's been your experience with this, with this process so far? That on? Yeah. Um, no, we haven't uh, actually said, we've done some of our own stuff, um, but I think there's, uh, there's a big opportunity for us to send cattle to guys that are willing to get into it. It's a big, it's a big undertaking, like as Cody said, like it's, it's uh, you got to get in the right mindset and, and be committed to it. And uh, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity now. Uh, the organic cattle business for us is growing. So, uh, you know, we more, more stock and more opportunities to, uh, to have cattle available for other organic producers to graze. Um, so yeah, we're open to, open to looking at anything. Yeah, so, f so for you, what, you know, how, many, how many animals would you have to move out to make it worth your while? Like, or how many acres would you need? Or, or you know, a very practical level, kind of what are you looking for in, a, say, a grain farm partner? Right, I guess it's, it's pretty flexible. Um, uh, the number of cattle just depends on the number of acres, um, but it's got to be like we talked about. It's it's got to be it's more the length of the time, not the amount of animals um, that you have them for, um, because we're not going to move cattle for 60 days of grazing or 30 days of grazing. It's got to be a full season of grazing to make it worth the move of the cattle. The cattle go through a, an adjustment period, getting trucks somewhere, so they got to be there for basically a full season. So that just uh, that. It all depends on how many acres and how many, how many grazing days you have is how many cattle we send, right? So we're pretty flexible from anywhere from 100 to 1,000 cattle we could send. So Yeah, okay. I guess I'll just add to that. It's probably about the, the management is the next thing too. You can get cattle on a truck and send them, send them kind of anywhere. That's not the problem. But if it, you need, the person at the other end is going to be managing them, then that's a different story if, you, if you've got to manage them yourself. So there's kind of two systems um, that you need to look at. The further away it is, I guess, the less practical it is if you have to manage it yourself. But if you've got, if the, if the people at the other end are able to look after those cattle and, and implement the management of them, then, then I think that the number of cattle is probably irrelevant and it comes down to more the time that they're going to be there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, of course it's got to be good. It's got to keep the cattle in. Yeah. But if you've got acres all around, and, so what is a good perimeter fence? What is, ideally, what is the best perimeter fence? So the, the question is kind of what, what's an ideal perimeter fence to keep animals in? It all depends on the cows, to be honest. We had cows that were trained to an electric wire. And we had a single, well, when we got, um, yeah, where there wasn't a, a perimeter barbed wire fence, we were using a, a single high tensile for the most part. And there were sometimes we were using a single poly wire next to the highway, and we never had a problem, cows or calves. We weren't grazing yearlings. We weren't grazing high-strung cows either. They knew what a wire was, and they respected it. So that, that was, that's been good enough for us for two years now. A uh, question relating to that, um, we've had a lot of luck as long as we train our cattle to the single wire electric fence inside the corral and get them used to it, and you don't have the high strung cattle, we have had very little problem with single poly electric. My, my question is though, has any of you guys looked at this GPS guided fencing with the collars and the, is it, for real, is it going to work or not? Because that would be a game changer for everybody. Yeah, I guess, I mean, we've, we haven't looked at it intensely. I mean, we've heard about it and kind of looked at some of the systems and thought, man, that'd be awesome. Um, I know Gallagher's doing some trials this year, I think, in Canada. Um, 
to on some of that gear. You know, it's quite expensive. Um, that's probably the that's probably the biggest thing, and and just sort of the just the unknowns. When you when when you watch the videos that they put up on YouTube, I mean, they look really good. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, you probably don't necessarily see the other side of it. I mean, I think they could work really good here in, in the summertime. Wintertime would be, you know, just the sunlight and keeping them charged. I think a lot of them are solar powered and, and stuff too. So I know, I, I mean, I think we're, that, that's kind of the direction things are heading. And I think that technology is probably going to get better. And, and yeah, I guess it's just who, yeah. Oh, shoot, I can't remember, but it was a, it was, it was a lot. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was, yeah, and and kind of unknown. But if you, I think where they've been successful in some of them and some of those bigger areas in you know like Australia or um, even down in the states, I think being able to move cattle on on bigger ranches to get them to graze certain areas, and it's probably not a big deal if the old one kind of doesn't go, but your majority of the herd are there. Um, I think that's that's whether I know they've been effective now. I'm I'm not sure on on the intensity, kind of how that works. If the cows get used to it and just kind of step out of the boundaries or not, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not sure. But yeah, I guess watch the space. If I could get back to my question about what's an ideal perimeter fence, because I guess where I'm from, everything's high strung. Because I'm a grain farmer and I've had cattle come from every which way. I want to get into this custom grazing thing, but I don't want to have mistakes where I have neighbors having cattle coming from all over the place. So the the, the so question. What is yeah. an ideal perimeter fence for a guy that wants to? <laughs> So it sounds like we have a bit of a kind of a two-part question. What's an ideal fence, and how do you deal with neighbors when and if cattle get out? So, so, so the cattle high strung or the neighbors high strung? <laughs> 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 so I mean, what, what, we'll take our example. I mean, we're putting up a four-wire barb. Um, we've done three-wire barb and electric. Like we've got some highway fences, and we were getting the odd cattle out, and and so we said, right, you know, we've got a. We've got to make sure the cattle aren't getting out of the highway. We wanted to, so we put a we put a four wire barb with a hot wire around it, and then we can utilise that hot wire for some cross fences and stuff too. Um, so you know we haven't needed to go any more excessive than that. Um, you know that's going to cost you probably about sixty bucks an acre on a if you're fencing a single quarter. You know if you can group a bigger area, if you can group a section, your your primitive fence is going to be a lot less than fencing individual quarters, obviously. So that's kind of a difference, you know, but you'll probably be down to about $30 an acre on electric fence and, you know, a little bit more management to go with it, though, on the on the electric would be the would be the difference. Um, yeah, but that's probably, that's pro if you're just getting into it, I mean, to be honest, that's probably not a bad start if you're worried about that and, and it's no different than us. I mean, we've, and our cattle are used to electric fence and I've had all that, but, you know, we wanted to make sure that they weren't getting out and so that's what we did. Yeah. Any thoughts on neighbors, guys? Well, just back to that is that maybe yearlings or, or something is not the best fit. Maybe cow-calf pair is a better fit for a situation like that with a, even a double-strand electric fence. Um, you, you know, it's just case by case, right? So I think that would be something to look at is grazing pairs instead of grazing yearlings because yearlings can be a little more high-strung and they get out they like to run. But that that hundred percent depends where those cattle are coming from too. Like our cattle are used to electric fence their whole life, um, so I mean I wouldn't have any problem sending yelling to someone. And if they said we've got a two wire fence and six to ten thousand volts going around it, that those cattle wouldn't get out. Um, you know, I guess you want to have a you want to have a plan B. I mean, you know, you want to have backup when cattle get out. I mean, for us, if cattle get out, go over a crop. I mean, you know, it's crop insurance come and sort it out, adjust it, here's the value, that's what we pay. And, uh, you know, that's kind of that's kind of how it works. I mean, you know, I guess the, the same thing. You could you could look at the same thing on the crop side with uh, with spray drift as well. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of, it, it's a, it's a two-way thing, but, you know, it's actually really no different. So, um, yeah, if they really annoy you, just... I guess don't worry about it too much and <laughs> get the cattle in and, and uh, you know, yeah. Or, or, you know, the other instance, I mean, you do it for silage or something too. You just 
price that crop and pay for it. But I think for us, the, the fairest one's been crop insurance come out, do an adjustment and pay the bill and move on. And, you know, you might find you need an extra wire on your fence may, may help alleviate that if it, if it comes to it. Yeah. Also, communication with neighbors is an important thing, too. Um, we butted up against a neighbor. Like, it was a complete grain field that we hadn't had cattle on in forever. And we just tied on to the neighbor's fence and used that as one side. And it was a three-wire barb, but it was a relatively old fence. And the cows broke a couple posts, and the neighbor was livid. Okay, so, well, we did, should have talked to them ahead of time. But we did a, a lot of fencing over two or three broken posts. But we, we fixed up his fence and mended fences and moved on. But we also learned our lesson, too, that you know, you've got to communicate. We had a question at the front here. Wondering about uh, are there any viable winter grazing options? We do a lot of cover crops, green manure crops, and I see the, I see the, I see the summer grazing options providing you got water and fences, but what about winter grazing, bale grazing? This would be in custom, custom feeding situations. Um, are there some alternatives that make sense to you as cattle producers? So, I mean, those are typically periods when we've got a lot of alfalfa in our system. We're alfalfa seed producers, but we do grow a lot of alfalfa and we don't always make use of it. Hay market drives us crazy. We want cattle manure on our land. Is there an option there for bale grazing in the fall or early winter that makes sense to a producer? And then my final question is related to uh, grazing alfalfa, pure stands of alfalfa. Is that, does that work? Is it, can you manage the risk? Um, and, uh, I guess I better stop there. I've got too many other questions. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can answer the first one. I'll let Ben get the second one. But on the we we'd be really open to to uh, gra um, having organic cows uh, custom graze in the winter time. Um, I think it can be mutual benef mutually beneficial um, because you're keeping all your nutrients on your farm, um, and it's way cheaper to haul cattle than it is to haul feed. Right, so. Um, there's definitely opportunities there for swath grazing or, or bale grazing, and it comes down to management too, and having a good good forage and and uh, yeah, and good management just to make sure the cows are are treated properly too, right? Um, but there's definitely opportunities there. Build, I guess building that relationship. If if you're a if you're a grain farmer that's not used to having cattle, I guess, and you're expecting to manage someone's cattle when, and you haven't done it before I guess you know it's a matter of I guess you know don't have 400 cows turn up there you know maybe you have two truckloads or something and, and you know you kind of start and it's something that you can something you can manage and you can figure that out on your system as well how that works and then kind of you know and then expand from there and then build that relationship I guess we would be definitely open to sending cattle and like Bryce said it's cheaper to put cattle on a truck than it is to haul the feed and you know every bale of alfalfa that you've got will be at least twenty-five dollars worth of nutrients that you're retaining on your farm. So if you can keep those nutrients and make some money on those cattle, then you know there's 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 big upside there's big upside there for for everyone, I guess. Um, but yeah, starting small is a good thing. I would definitely say if if you know and and having the right having the right infrastructure and stuff set up and and you know like uh, like Cody did there too, having that. Um, you know, figuring it out in that first year, not expecting, not expecting the world from either party, I guess, having something that fits and then being prepared to change that system as it, as it goes, I think is pretty important. So yeah, it's just it's kind of relationship building, I guess, is a big part of it. Um, but yeah, having, having water, water and, and infrastructure. Uh, One of my questions I forgot was on snow as a water source. What's your opinion? Um, I... We've done, we've, we've done it. We kind of do it. We're confident to do it on our own cows because it, it varies with the different seasons, but we've always got an additional source um, that, we can, that we can go to. So I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to send cattle out on, on just snow if that was the only source. 
if, they, if there was a good water source available somewhere, you may have to change the system to have the cattle get to it. Um, and I would, I would certainly be good with that if, if you, know, you get halfway through the season and the cows are on, you know, if there's fresh snow and, they, and they're not interested in water, then there's nothing wrong with that. Um, quite often, you know, the cow, our cows will have to walk a mile or more back to water, and quite often when they get to that far end of that field, they actually just stop coming back and they just stay down there and they're getting enough themselves so so yeah but it's every season's a little different you know have you got enough snow is that snow really hard and crusted um you know that's going to impact how much moisture they can get out of that um I'll, you got, I, I got a, oh, if you, you're done yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. okay I, i've got a question for you guys uh on the topic of the um kind of expanded grazing season um, we've been looking into grazing um, either fall rye or winter wheat like you were talking about but when I bounced it off our certifier they said that they would consider that a raw manure application and we need 120 day withdrawal before we can harvest How, do you guys get around that have you experienced that what's what's your take uh, well we've been usually harvesting for feed so not for human consumption and uh, remote yeah so that's how we get around that part of it, I guess. And I've never had that brought up to me, actually. So um, never, never had that come up, actually. We, on, on the ones that we've harvested, we haven't had, they haven't been organic crops. So I, but yeah, I've never, it's never even, it's never even crossed my mind, to be honest, that it would be a, that it would be an issue. Um, but I guess maybe it is, I don't know. Yeah. Shit, it's a bit of a stretch, that one, probably, but yeah. So maybe just to answer the second part of that question, the, the comment was on can you graze uh, pure alfalfa stands and, and right. what are you guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, so we, we, we are grazing. I guess we're not typically seeding pure alfalfa stands for grazing. We're seeding a mix, but what you'll see in the first three to four years, I mean, it's pretty much straight alfalfa anyway. I mean, there's grass and stuff coming in the, in the base, but a lot of the times they're grazing. So they're, they're, they're harvesting straight alfalfa typically. Um, so... Yeah, that's that. The, you, there is some bloat risks to uh, to to come with that. It, uh, that definitely need to be managed, but they yeah can be managed. Oh no, did you see the slides that I had up? I'm sorry, I missed your okay, right. Yeah, so there's a few things that we uh, there's a few things uh, on on grazing straight alfalfa or a high legume alfalfa is um, you know moving in the afternoon when it's uh, when it's dry, making sure there's no dew on it. Um, and that, in, in our mind, that helps with salivation because um, if they're eating wet forage, they're not salivating, breaking that down in their mouth at the time. Um, so we'll plan our moves for the for the afternoon for sure. Um, we have a four to six day grazing window per cell, um, so they're slightly bigger than our grass. You know, on our grasses, we're in a one to two days and out, so that we're not affecting that regrowth. Whereas alfalfa will grow from the base so that we, we've got a longer time frame before we actually um, are affecting that regrowth um, so we can graze it down and then we've got a bigger window to manage them we can move them a day earlier or a day later and kind of keep an eye on them so that they're not hungry when we get down to single day moves on on alfalfa then you know they can be hungry for two hours and 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 there's, you've got a shorter window of less room for less room for error and we've been in those situations when we first started grazing alfalfa we were trying to be super intensive we were moving every day we were moving fences and then boom we had a blowout we killed 30 head um so that was pretty untidy but uh, <laughs> but you know but we didn't we you know, there was 200 and something in the mob like that was that that was worst case scenario but we had a perfect storm then too um we had we moved and they never got shifted the night before because it was um it was getting late at night and I wanted to be able to watch them going into a fresh break so like they had nothing to eat it moved them so then went out there first thing in the morning moved them um, you know there was a dew they were hungry it was a hot morning the sun was out everything was growing nitrates would have been high in the plant so it was like boom 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 bang so that was that's what happened but you know that's because of that I guess we you know most people would have said holy shit we're not doing that again like that's we're done. It, this system doesn't work. But we knew that with alfalfa, we, it, it was the key to our system working is figuring out how to manage it. So it was just unfortunate that we had to go through that. But we, um, you know, we wouldn't be where we were today if we didn't, probably. So that's just, uh, you, you, you live and learn and, and I guess, you know, sharing what, what we've done and, and you know, you, you need to manage it. But 
Yeah, there's definitely ways to do it and get good results out of it. Yeah. My uh, question E here backed out, so I'll throw you guys one. Uh, Cody threw a lure earlier, and you can start on this, and maybe the other two can weigh in, but how bringing livestock into your systems is helping you to meet some of those other regenerative ag principles is, I think, a great thing for each of you to talk a little bit about, and somebody else put their hand up, and I'll come find them with a the mic. Uh, livestock is one of the soil health principles, but they also uh, support the others really well. When we're grazing cover crops, we're not tilling them in, and that's reducing our tillage right there. Uh, our goal is to eat half of the plant and leave half of the plant. And the cattle are grazing the, the tops, they're grazing the, the heads of the, the oats, the pods of the peas, they're grazing some of the most uh, nutritious stuff for the cows, and they're leaving the, the stocky stuff, which is gonna retain a cover longer. So that's another, one of the principles is keep the soil covered. Living root in the soil as long as possible, it's also forcing us to do things like the, the shoulder season grazing. We need, want something green and growing in, and that we can graze in later into the fall, earlier in the spring. So that's kind of pushing us to, to have something growing in those seasons to be grazing. Um, on the, the flip side, we could be uh, either bale grazing, swath grazing, but ideally we would like to be gr uh, grazing something that's green and growing. And uh, diversity, uh, well, like I was showing in our cover crop mixes, it adds an opportunity to put in all kinds of different stuff, uh, as long as it's palatable to the cows, or even if it's not, if there's something uh, um, that you're putting in more for soil building than for grazing, the cows will go around it, whether it's something like uh, uh, phacelia or sunflowers. Like, do cows like eating sunflowers? I, I never considered it. I just wanted a sunflower growing in my cover crop mix. And not heavy, but just a few here and there. And that taproot's gonna go down, it's gonna punch through the hard pan, it's gonna cycle nutrients and, and do all that good stuff. So it's providing either, it, it's either pushing us to do it or it's providing an opportunity for us to do the rest of the soil health principles. Yeah, so I guess adding the, adding the cattle, I mean, we've, we've come from the side where cattle are our main system and, and we're kind of now trying to integrate them into the into the cropping system um, but it's all part of having a resilient system um, and you know and some flexibility um, is a part of that so we can use feed crops um, on that land extending rotations you know the pretty typical rotation across the prairies is wheat and canola I mean that's that's not even a rotation um, so you know <laughs> add uh, adding something into that mix when you're looking at a conventional system even you know and, and we've got guys coming to us now we've where we've moved out to Ryan um, and and saying you know the, the crop prices are down and basically they don't know what to do or what else to do they just gonna some guys are just gonna keep doing it because it's all they that's just what they do um, and I've done it for the last hundred years um, but we've got some guys coming to us now saying man you know can can we add some things to our rotation some silage or some grazing mixes and stuff so that you know they can actually extend their rotations because they're getting disease pressure and things like that which is which is obviously that's going to happen um so um so that's yeah that's there's lots of different ways i guess and and but for us it's about looking at that big picture you know some of these crops that we grow are not they can be used for cattle or they can be harvested too so i mean we've got up to the end of the year to decide what's going to happen to that crop. It doesn't have to get seeded for one specific purpose. Um, you know, we're actually coming at it more from the cattle side. So if we, when we're seeding some of these mixes in with our cereals, we actually don't care if the stuff underneath that was there to add value to the cash crop actually outcompetes and, and we have a fantastic crop because we'll just swath graze it or we'll do something else with it and, and get a good return and it's going to be even better for the soil. So we're kind of coming at it from that aspect, whereas a lot of guys that are getting into it, you know, they're really concerned about yield loss on adding some of these things and so they probably don't do a very good job at adding diversity into their mix because they're always hesitant to add too much or worried it's going to affect the crop and, you know, we can come at it from the other way and say, shit, that's great. Who cares? We're going to feed it to these cows. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's the same as our operation where it's, it's a cattle-based operation. So I guess the, the benefits come by default by having lots of livestock. 
um, you can't help but benefit your land with livestock. Um, so it's the same as being flexible. Um, we, we grow lots of different crops and we, um, at times we don't know if we're going to be combining or we're going to be grazing or we're going to be chopping it for silage. We, you know, that's being flexible. Uh, this past year, I uh, had a spring wheat crop that uh, was a really good crop and I chopped it for silage and I had some, a lot of people call me crazy. But at the same time, the, the wheat would have been still sitting in the bin. I'm using that wheat silage, putting it through the cattle, retaining all the nutrients on my farm. And uh, I still, that silage was still a really good cash crop for me. Um, so with cattle, you're really flexible. That's the benefit. And your, your soil gets better by, by not even, you know, it just happens because that's what livestock do. Um, so the organic cash cropping is almost a byproduct of what we're really doing. We're really focused on the cattle. So we grow a cash crop. It's, uh, it's not our main business and it just happens by default, basically. And that, that reminds me of another comment that we're coming at this from the exact opposite way, but having cattle allows us to rotate perennials through our cash cropping system. Uh, a few years ago, we started a program where we're taking one field out of cash crop and putting it into perennials, leaving it there for three years, and then breaking it up, putting it back into the cash crop. So we're basically doing the, the opposite of what you're doing, rotating cash crop through your perennials. And also having cattle... Uh, in addition, it's also diversifying our cash flow and our income. Having a nice cash injection right after harvest without having to, to, to market our grain in, in October, November and have it sold and paid for is, uh, is a big help. It's, it's helping us spread our cash flow around the year. Yeah, and just looking at that system too, when we go back to putting, uh, bringing cattle in, if you can... If you can look at that system, if you're a grain farmer specifically, actually seeding down, having some perennial ground so that those animals can come in there early and then having those late season ones, you know, if those animals can stay there for 150 to, you know, 200 days, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, that first year that you seed down that perennial, you could make hay production. You could retain that hay for the following year when those cattle come in. They could then come in early eat that hay on that land, I've got that perennial, then you can have some annuals at the end of the season, and if you've got hay left over, you keep those cows there at the other end of the season too. So, you, you know, you could, it, it's, if you can add those things into your system, it's going to make a really valuable system, and, a, and a, I, mean, I guess it's going to show the cattle guy that you're committed to. If you're just seeding an annual crop and you want to make all this money off it and it's a short period of time, it's kind of like, wow, you know, you, it might be a one-hit wonder kind of thing and it might not go that well, but if you... Um, if, if, you're actually, if you can actually look at that system and add some things to work, then, man, that's a pretty attractive option for a, for a cattle producer. You know, knows you're committed and knows that, you know, there's a solid place for those cattle to go. Good. We had a question over here. Okay. Uh, one objective of a green mineral crop would be to fight weeds in that year. And uh, my question would be, like, how do you get cows to eat thistles, for example? Like, how, how, do, you, how do you control weeds effectively? Uh, weeds, well, through the competition of the cover crops, but I took the slide out of my presentation from a, another one I did. I was amazed. The cows actually went through, when the thistle was in bloom, the cows ate the, blo the blossoms off the thistles and just topped the thistle and... Then the, uh, the painted lady butterflies moved in and uh, inhabited the, the rest of the thistle. It didn't kill the thistle, but it didn't allow it to reproduce, didn't set seed, and it set it back somewhat. Uh, is it a solution to thistle? No, but it's probably as effective as one passive tillage, maybe. A lot of, I guess, a lot of different weeds are, are actually palatable at different times of the different times of their growing cycle too. Quite often, it's when they're immature. I guess a lot of young ones. So, you know, the, if you get the timing, getting the cattle on there. If, if you've got a specific weed that you're trying to manage, I guess then you know timing's going to be everything to get cattle on there to to manage that too. So yeah, we've had a lot of a, a lot of weeds are, are very palatable. You know. Thistles may be a little different, but yeah, I guess don't. If you've got a weedy field that you've been tilling for years and years and years, and you think that cattle are going to solve that problem in one year, I, you know, it's probably not going to happen. You've probably got to look at, 
You probably got to look at your system before that, and if it took you 15 years to get into that mess, it's probably going to take similar to get out of it too. So, you know, and, and a lot of people think they, they're going to see the cover crop and all their problems are going to be solved and it's going to be a miracle. Um, you know, I've had guys come to me, you know, they've got 15 bushel barley and they've been tilling their land and adding nothing to it for 20 years and, and you know, they're looking for a miracle. Well, it, it took 20 years to get into that state. It's going to take some time to get out of it, but you need to start somewhere and, and make sure you've got that got that system and you're implementing those crops throughout I mean you know one of the best things in that situation I would say is seed it down to perennial give that land a break and 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 then you know have a five six year cycle then start again I mean we've got some fantastic crops coming out of summer we've got some fantastic crops coming out of poor perennial ground that's been poorly managed for 20 years and you know we're breaking up and getting some really good results we're only just now getting into some of the land that's been seeded down for five years so that that cycle we're actually only just starting on that on that so i mean we're thinking those crops are going to be so much better than the ones that were on poorly managed perennial ground that had no alfalfa no legumes left in it um yeah so i guess i guess look at look at the whole system look at what's happened to that ground and and you know i guess you know look definitely look forward to what you can do and and if it's got to that state there's maybe some things that need to change if you don't change what you do then yeah you're gonna you, you're gonna have the same results i guess i've heard it said cover crops are like a swiss army knife they can do a lot of different things but they're only really good at one or two things at a time are there any other questions comments yes sir cover crops that'll compete in saline and foxtail barley areas. So we've been on an, on an annual basis, I guess, we've been using some uh, Italian ryegrasses, um, some turnips and some radish in those areas as well. Um, there's some, there's some, a lot of the time we're looking at those areas, we're gonna be looking at more perennial kind of stuff. Right? That, that's not necessarily something I would say that you're gonna fix with an annual cover crop. You might get some growth there, but I think it's probably a situation that you need to look at some perennial stuff in those areas for a, for a certain amount of time too. Good. Um, maybe just one more question here to wrap things up. I'm, uh, I'm curious about the, the, the terms of the agreement that you would come to between yourself as a cattle farmer and a grain farmer or vice versa. And I know, Cody, you mentioned it a little bit in your presentation. Um, you know, who, so, and, and you talked about the flow of money, you know, does, does the cattle guy pay the grain guy for the land or does the grain guy pay the, the cattle guy for the, the grazing service or, or what are your thoughts on, on how that could look or how it could work? Any thoughts from the panel? <laughs> well, I think there's, you know, you can, uh, it depends, like, on the, on the summertime grazing and winter grazing, it's, uh, two completely different uh, um, different ball games, I guess. Uh, um, in management, I guess um, you could look at it as a whole too, and it's got to be like a long term thing where it's not a one off because it's got to be mutually beneficial and it's got to be case by case. Um, I, I just think that you have to figure out the co everyone's costs and then uh, come up with something that works for both ways and both people are happy. That's mutually beneficial. Because if it's not mutually beneficial, it's not going to work. Right. Yeah, I like... Cody had a really good example for a start. The first year that you did it, I mean, that's, a, that's the best case. That's the best <laughs> case scenario. I guess as a grain farmer, I mean, you need to... You, you, we need to evaluate the benefits. And I guess that, that's a really hard one to evaluate those benefits. You know, put a number on the, on the exact benefits. In my opinion, I think that's actually worth more than just having the cattle on there. If your alternative is to grow a cover crop and till it in, I mean, I would, if I was in the grain side I'd, and I didn't have cattle, I'd say, shit, bring your cows. Mm. Bring them in, put some fence up, do what you want with it. If I don't have to touch it, that's fantastic. Um, you know, we've got some guys around, you know, close to, close to home. I've got no interest in cattle. You know, stubble grazing, for instance. Um, in that instance, we're putting up the fence. You know, we're paying them 50 cents for a pair in the in the autumn time for grazing, we do all the management. We just 
write them a we just write them a check. Um, you know, so I mean they're getting I think they they're getting some pretty good value having those cattle out there, but you know they couldn't care less if the cattle were there or not. So you know it's it's kind of up to us to put that system in place and I guess you know have it have it work for us. Um, you know we've got some guys around there. If we put the fence up, I mean they don't. This is just stubble. They they don't want to check at the end of the year they'd say you're doing as much good for us as as anything you know they're not having to harrow or do anything in the spring the cows are eat, you know cleaning up around the edges and sloughs and whatnot too so it, it kind of depends who you're who you're working with but obviously for us I mean that guy that doesn't want us to pay and sees the benefit I mean if he's got extra land right there that we can fence I mean we're going to fence his land before we have to fence the stuff that we're paying 50 cents for too so um, that's kind of that's kind of how that uh, how that works, and yeah, the summer grazing, um, you know, per head day rate, just just figuring that out. Like Bryce said, figuring out those costs and stuff too. There's trucking costs. There's you know, there's other things that are that are going to come along from the cattle producer side, and uh, and there's other benefits that are going to come to the to the person that's growing that crop. I just think you got to keep in mind that it's it's not a it's not going to be a get rich scheme like it's it's got to be you know you got to think of the whole system it's not a i don't think it's the benefits are are keeping the nutrients on your farm and uh and integrating the livestock more than you know there's there's obviously a benefit of uh for the cattle producer having the grazing too but it's uh, like it's not a get rich thing is there's a lot of different values to consider in doing it yeah and i think I think organic producers probably understand that benefit because they're doing a lot of these things already, more so than you know a conventional guy that's um, you know wanting to grow a cover crop to benefit him. I think that you know that's that's slightly uh, it's slightly different. You know the organic community is already doing a lot of these things, already growing these crops and and adding that manure and, and those plough downs and stuff too. So it's it's uh, there's a lot more. Advantage, I guess, that are seen in that system from the organic side, as opposed to as opposed to the conventional side. I think these guys just hit on the real key of it that uh, the the intangibles, the stuff you can't really put a, a dollar value on. Um, in 2018, when our farm took on the custom grazing contract, uh, we were in a well a drought through most of the year, not as bad as the year before, but one of our grazing mixes had corn in it that got six inches tall, turned brown, and died because there was just nothing there. And when I showed those two pictures of how the cows trampled, um, the picture on the left with uh, the oat um, the left down nasa mat, I had to go looking for that picture, whereas the one where it was just dust, that wasn't as hard to find. So the, the, where I'm going with that is that there wasn't the, the volume of grazing that year, like uh, what uh, Ben was putting up earlier, with six, eight thousand pounds of dry matter a year, how do you do that? <laughs> so it, for us, it, it definitely was not a get-rich-quick scheme. It was more of uh, spending less money than burning fuel and uh, um, disking it in. When, especially when you factor in labor, because we're hauling water every day and moving fence every day. Um, it actually, it, it was a money losing proposition when we were getting paid to, to graze cattle, but it, it wasn't, uh, it, it was still better than putting the, the equipment out there and, uh, and plowing it in. Um, yeah. Good. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Why don't we give these guys a round of applause?